Good evening, dear friends, and greetings in Jesus. I have not been to the Orange Free State or the Bloemfontein in some time, but it's good to be back and to be with you and to share the fellowship of the Lord. If you don't know me by way of qualification, my family is actually a mixture of Irish and Jewish. As a kid in New York, I went both to a Catholic school and to the Jewish community center. And at a young age, I determined that I'd seen two false religions in my life. One a total corruption of the Old Testament, and the other a total corruption of the New. I left all belief in God as such, although I believed there was a God, but I hated organized religion of every description. I didn't really know the difference between the real Jesus of the Gospel and that plastic one on the dashboard of a car. I came to faith in Jesus by trying to disprove the Bible, first with science, I had a science background, and then trying to disprove the Bible with history and archaeology. But the more I tried to disprove it, the more evidence I found to believe it. It got to the point where it would have taken me more faith to reject Jesus than it did to accept him simply based on the evidence. But I was steeped in the drug culture of the 1960s when I was at university, and I was a radical socialist. I was basically a communist at that time with certain reasons. There were certain reasons I was. For instance, black people would come back from Vietnam in the American army and not be allowed to go to university in America after they just fought for freedom. They couldn't get an education the same as a white person. To me, this seemed like an injustice. The American government was completely corrupt in the days of Nixon and so forth. It was completely corrupt, no principles whatsoever. They were telling young people, you have to go fight the communists of Vietnam. And at the same time, they were opening the door to trade with China and detente with Russia, and they were trading with the communists. It was all hypocrisy. It was all crooked business. It was all lies. It was all bigotry. It was all bad. Now, my mistake, of course, was I threw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. I didn't know the difference between the real Jesus and the Jesus of the gospel. My beliefs in socialism, because I thought it was scientific, were a reaction to the injustices and corruption I saw. Many people who are of a left-wing persuasion are not bad people, they're just naive people and they see certain things that are wrong and they have a wrong idea about what is going to correct it. I came to realize that no place in the world has socialism ever worked. Joseph Stalin was a socialist. Adolf Hitler was a socialist. To this very day, Maduro and these people who destroyed Venezuela, taken a rich country and turned it into a poor one, were socialists. It has never worked. Now, I'm not against socialists but I just don't believe it's the solution to man's problems. I believe the solution to man's problems is the gospel of Jesus. Be that as it may, we have to be very realistic now. My children are born in Galilee, my family are Israeli. I immigrated to Israel after becoming a believer in Jesus. I've lived in the Middle East. I've lived through some very difficult situations. I've seen tremendous acts of terror I was just in Israel last week. Even in my native New York, the Muslims killed my sister's husband on September 11th in the Twin Towers. But coming from Israel, I warned that what was happening in the Middle East was going to come to Europe, to Britain, to America, a conflict with Islam. I saw these things coming. About 20 years ago, after a Bible study in Port Elizabeth, in your country, I was drinking some coffee after the Bible study with some Christian businessmen, some rather successful Christian businessmen in Port Elizabeth. And they asked me what I thought about what was going on in South Africa and what was going to happen. And I told them that South Africa is a country that replaced one evil with another. It didn't turn to Jesus, it turned to socialism and these kinds of ideas. It's replaced one evil with another. And I said at that time, nearly 20 years ago, 
and there were witnesses and people who heard it, a few of them here tonight, that if you want to see the future of South Africa, look at Zimbabwe today, look at what Mugabe is doing and is going to do, this will come to South Africa. Some people were very naive. Now, people always want to hope for the best. But living in Israel made me live in the real world as I never had before. Last week in Israel, there were balloons flying over from the Gaza Strip, burning thousands and thousands of acres of farmland and forest. The international media ignores what was happening. It's time for reality. You're facing a situation where we can't cover it up with religion anymore. You can't ignore what is really happening to your country and what is already happening and going to happen. I have to be honest. We have people on the mad list of our ministry in Australia, in England, in New Zealand, who used to be on our mad list in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. They got out of here. Uh, there are people who come to my meetings in England, in Great Britain, who I used to see at my meetings in Johannesburg, <laughs> in Cape Town. Many people have left. Many people saw the writing on the wall and have left. These are Christians. But you are still here, and I cannot avoid the realities of what is happening. We have to be very, very realistic. In Israel, there are a number of Jews who believe in Jesus now, quite a number. When I first immigrated to Israel in the 1970s, there were about 200 known Jewish born-again believers in Jesus. Nobody knows how many there are today, but there are thousands, thousands. And although they are opposed even by the Orthodox Jews, they lived through the same conflict and strife and threat as all the other Israelis, plus they're even hated by their own people because of their faith in Jesus as the Messiah on top of it. I'm talking here about my family now. My son was in the Israeli army in a combat brigade and can tell you things. Be that as it may, we have to be very realistic. We cannot beat around the bush. Israel and the Jews are a microcosm of the human condition. God teaches about the rest of the human race through the example of Israel and the Jews. When you read the Old Testament, there'd be a revival, then a national backsliding, and a revival, and a back, it was like a roller coaster. One generation could change everything. It could go into complete godlessness overnight, and then other nations would oppress them. They'd be in desperate circumstances, and in their desperation only, they turned to God. In all of human history, there are five nations more than any other, five nations more than any other, that have had the most scriptural influence in their foundations as societies. Five have had more scripture woven into their foundation as nations and societies than any other. The first, of course, is Israel. The second would be Great Britain. A third would be the United States. A fourth would be New Zealand. And the fifth would be South Africa. All the other countries in the world did not have that kind of scriptural influence in their foundations 
as countries. The Jews have the most truth. The British have the most truth. The Americans have the most truth. The New Zealand Kiwis have the most truth. And the South Africans have the most truth. Of all the nations, these five countries have had the most truth. And all five of those nations are completely backslidden. They have turned away from the Lord and from the faith. I do not say that there are not individuals in those nations who do believe. There are. And in Israel, there's a growing number, as the scripture says. Romans 11 tells us the first Christians were Jews and the last Christians will be Jews. The natural branches will be grafted in again. My wife's parents died in the Holocaust and my own children came to believe in Jesus as children in Galilee where they were born. And they told their grandparents who survived the Holocaust narrowly, most of my wife's family was killed. Why don't you believe in our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus? I've seen the kinds of realities you face. A couple of weeks from now, I have to return to Vietnam. I meet with the underground church in Vietnam. I began going to Vietnam smuggling Bibles. And I meet with the pastors secretly from the mountain tribes of Vietnam. I once asked how many of you brethren have been in prison for your faith? Nearly every one of them. They took one pastor, a young guy, who'd been to my meetings. They arrested him and knocked all of his teeth out. Then they released him for 18 days so everybody could see what happened to him. And then they arrested him again. There was another case where somebody came to faith. The local Communist Party in the mountain region of Vietnam called Diem set his house on fire. He and one of his children survived. His wife, another believer, and four children were all burned alive. What do you say to somebody like that? I have known other people who face what you face. I've spoken in Muslim countries. I've spoken in communist countries, and I do on a regular basis. I'm not naive to these things. In Israel, just a week ago, I saw the tanks heading for the Golan Heights again. Some people, even unsaved people, are beginning to speculate, will it be a Gog and Magog scenario? Are we going to fight Russia and Iran and Turkey? Reading the book of Daniel, chapter 10, these are not even believers, and the rabbis are asking these questions. It's quite a situation in Israel. Now let's look at the reality of Israel, because Israel teaches about other nations. Of those five nations I told you, the first was Israel that had the most truth. The Jews had the gospel first. Jesus is a Jew. Every writer of the New Testament is a Jew. They had it first. Well, let's look. By definition, an indigenous people cannot be an occupying presence. An Irishman cannot occupy Dublin. A Maori cannot occupy New Zealand. An Apache cannot occupy Arizona because they were there first. So while an Apache cannot occupy Arizona and while a Maori cannot occupy New Zealand or an Irishman cannot occupy Dublin, 
somehow a Jew can occupy Jerusalem and Jericho and Bethlehem. How can an indigenous people be called an occupying presence when they were there first? Politicians lie. Even many preachers lie. Archaeology doesn't lie. The scriptures tell us that Abraham was in the land of Canaan from the time of the Canaanites. Every archaeological dig shows the Jews were there first. But somehow the world propagates of a lie that they came and stole the land from the Muslims. Now what really happened was this. There was never a Palestinian state. Never. Except one. In 1968, Yasser Arafat said, Jordan is Palestine. In 1970, King Hussein of Jordan said, Palestine is Jordan. The United Nations affirmed what had been determined by the League of Nations in San Remo, Italy that Jordan would be, for the Arab Muslims, and Israel would be for the Jews. This was during the time of the British Mandate. They talk about a two-state solution. Well, this is nonsense. There's always been a two-state solution. Who said so? The British government? The League of Nations, the United Nations, the government of Jordan, and Yasser Arafat. Before the House of Saud came to power in Saudi Arabia, King Musharraf of Saudi Arabia said Israel's for the Jews. Before the Ba'ath Party of Saddam Hussein came to power in Iraq, King Faisal II of Iraq said Israel is for the Jews. But something happened in the 1970s. The tooth fairy came with a magic wand. And Arab Muslims who live in the West Bank went to bed one night believing they were Jordanians. But after the tooth fairy came and waved the magic wand, they woke up the next day and were told, lo and behold, they were now Palestinians. They never claimed it before. You've got to understand something. From 1948, the birth, rebirth of Israel, until 1967, the Six-Day War, when they recaptured Jerusalem and the West Bank, for nearly 20 years, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip were all in the hands of Arab Muslims. If they wanted another Palestinian Arab Muslim state, in addition to the one they and everyone else said they already had, why didn't they create one when they had 20 years to do it? But we're supposed to forget this. We're supposed to engage in revisionism. We're supposed to rewrite history and believe the lie and the narrative. We're supposed to think like the socialist Nazi, Goebbels. Tell a lie often enough and people will think it's the truth. And if you refuse to believe the lie, it's because you're a bigot or an Islamophobe. And so Israel lives in a nation where everybody's son is in the army, where every husband and every father is in the reserves, where everybody 
has a rifle, and where everybody doesn't talk about if there's going to be a war, then we talk about when the next one will be. Now this is happening for a reason we'll look at in the scriptures in a moment. You've got to understand something. When the Jews came to Israel, most of that land, under the Turks and then under the British, was uninhabited. It was malaria-infested swamps and deserts that had not been irrigated. There were no farms there. There were no kibbutzes. There were no moshavs. There was no, it was just swamp and desert. These Jews came, secular Jews, not religious ones, drained the swamps, irrigated the desert, and made a country that was agriculturally prosperous, and then industrially prosperous, and now high-tech prosperous. They did it by hard work, by using their brains, and because after the Holocaust, they knew it was the only way to survive was to have their own nation. When this began to happen under the British, Arabs, Arab Muslims from Egypt, from Tunisia, from Syria, from the surrounding nations began moving to, is to what became Israel. Because they saw it as a way to have a better standard of living than they had in the Muslim world. They came there and immigrated there. Yasser Arafat was born in Egypt. Educated in Egypt, served in the Egyptian army. He wasn't born in Israel or what he called Palestine. There was no Palestine, never was. Except in the ancient world, Palestine is simply the Latin way of saying Philistine. The Philistinians were people from Crete. They weren't Arabs. There hasn't been a true Palestinian on the face of the earth in 2,500 years. Anthropologically, genetically, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. They've not existed in two and a half thousand years. These people are Arab Muslims, mainly. And so, you have a situation. A country that was largely uninhabited. A country where people came from Europe as refugees. They came from Europe, and they went to a land where there was no cultivation of the land, and they cultivated it, and through hard work and diligence, they made prosperous farms. They irrigated it, worked the land. And as that happened, people from surrounding countries saw it was better than where they lived. So they began flocking into that land. But all of a sudden, because of lies, both religious and political, now they said the land was stolen and we're taking it back. And we have a right to engage in violence to take it back. Does any of this story sound familiar to you? I was against the apartheid. I was against it. I wouldn't have spoken in a segregated church. Theologically, I have never agreed with Calvinism. I've never agreed with the Dormanese and the Dutch Reformed Church. I think that theology is not true Christianity. I don't believe sprinkling an infant makes somebody a Christian. You have to be born of the Spirit. I've never believed it. But neither did I believe the lies I was told by the media except for KwaZulu-Natal. Most of South Africa was only inhabited by nomadic and semi-nomadic Bushmen. There was not a lot of people here. 
There were no fonts. Now with the Vortrekkers, things began to change, and then with the British, things began to change with the Zulu Wars and things like this. But then people began leaving other countries to come to South Africa. The same as people left Tunisia and Egypt and Syria to come for a better life under the Jews. I remember when people were leaving Angola and Mozambique and other such countries to come south to live in South Africa. Even under the apartheid. Now understand something. I was born in New York and my family are Irish and Jewish. The Jews, the Irish, and the Americans all fought the British for their independence. Same as you had the Boer Wars. What the British did and I'm not against the British people, you understand. I live in England. What the British did here with the Boer Wars, <laughs> they did the same thing to the Irish, you understand? For the potato famines and things like that. They starved people to death in huge numbers. That's why there's so many Irish in America. My entire background, American, Jewish, Irish, is anti-colonialist. They all fought the British. My ancestors fought the British. I don't like colonialism. Unless the people want it. Most of the Chinese people in Hong Kong wanted to stay British. I don't blame them. The Spanish people in Gibraltar want to stay British. I don't blame them. The Hispanic people in Puerto Rico want to stay American. I don't blame them. If people choose it because they believe it's in their benefit, I have no problem with it. No. But I don't like colonialism. Bad things happened in Africa when the British and other European powers came. They sent missionaries, but they weren't missionaries who were trying to make followers of Jesus. They were so-called missionaries who were agents of colonialism who tried to make Africans subjects of the Queen. <laughs> I know all of these things, but I also know that our ministry operates in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, I've been to Zambia, Zimbabwe obviously. There is not one country, not one country, not even one country in post-colonial Africa where the indigenous black people were not better off under the British. Everybody yelled about the Sharpsburg 22 or whatever it was. But the BBC never said anything about the Burundi 100,000. The genocide in Rwanda. The UN didn't want to know. What happened in the Central African Republic, Uganda under Idi Amin, one case after another. If you want to see real bigotry, look at tribalism. But of course, the Western media will never tell you that side of the story. They won't tell you that people were leaving black African countries to live in South Africa under the apartheid because it was still not as bad as where they came from. It's not to justify apartheid. 
But now let's go to Israel. According to the World Health Organization of the United Nations, the Arabs in the Gaza Strip, their standard of living in everything, from infant mortality to longevity to employment, improved 370% under the Israelis compared to what it was before 1967. These are the essential things of life. Infant mortality, longevity, employment. 370% improvement, according to the UN. The United Nothing. According to the World Health Organization of the UN, the standard of living of the Arabs of the West Bank improved 320% under the Israelis. But all of a sudden, nobody talks about that. You took our land. You never had our land. You believe in archaeology? Get a shovel and dig. We were here first. We don't mind you living here if you live here peacefully. But it doesn't work that way. Islam divides the whole world into two factions. Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb. The world of Islam and the world of the sword. They believe they have a mandate from their Arabian moon god, Allah, to conquer everybody else. And once they get hold of a land, their Allahs give it to them. And that, that is the basis of their demand. They have no historical demand. Islam says that Ishmael was the chosen son, not Isaac. So all the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob should be going to the descendants of Ishmael and Esau. That's their belief. They expect the rest of the world to accept their religion. That's what it all comes down to. But of course, because of the oil industry and things like this, nobody's going to tell the truth. It's all politics and corruption. Now the Israelis sit there, and they're bewildered. Don't people know that we treat the Arabs better than they treated each other? As soon as we gave Gaza back, Hamas took it over and destroyed the place. After we built it up, how come the world can't see this? Why is everybody against us? Why are they ignoring things? Every day taking balloons with Molotov cocktails, destroying thousands and thousands of acres and hectares of, of, of aggregable land and forest. But if we shoot back, we're the bad guys. Can you imagine a situation where they fire Katusha rockets at your civilians. They don't care if they hit a school or a hospital. And when you're forced to fire back in self-defense, they use their own civilians as human shields. They store the Katusha rockets in schools and in hospitals and launch the rockets next to schools and hospitals so when the Israelis are forced to fire back in self-defense, forced to fire back, there's going to be collateral damage. And then CNN is going to come in with the BBC and say, look what the Jews did. This is reality. The Jews can't understand, why can't the world see this? We're the victim here. We only want the peace. Well, the world has turned its back on you. Even your Dutch cousins aren't interested in this place. Your Afrikaans sounds funny to them. They don't like Buddha music. And your how the cheese is not the same as theirs. They don't care. They don't care. 
The world is not interested in you. The media is not telling the truth about you. Hamas represents the victims. The ANC represents the victims. Not to be political, but you've got this guy, Olim, I call him melanoma. And because of what he's saying, the ANC says, we have to take your farms because the ANC is afraid they're going to lose votes from Alima. And so you live in fear. Just like the Israelis, you live with a gun in one hand, and on the other hand, you're looking at a newspaper that doesn't tell you the truth. Coming from Israel, having an Israeli family, I understand your frustration. I understand your fear. A toy store near where my children were taken by my wife to buy toys when they were little, near where we lived. The Muslims threw hand grenades into the toy store. The targets were children. It was a bus stop in Jerusalem. Five minutes after I left it, a suicide bomber blew up the bus, killed 17 people. Where I had just been. Again, my own family was victimized on September 11th. You see, I wouldn't have the right to talk this way to you if I didn't understand what you're going through. You understand what I'm saying? I've had family killed. I know what it is. And I know what it is for the world to turn its back on you. I know what it is to turn on the BBC and the CNN and nobody cares what happens to you, but they all tell you the lie. But again, the Jews, Israel, or the microcosm of the human condition. Look with me, please, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. the burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Now in the New Testament we read, the Logos became Sarx, the word became flesh. Who is the word of the Lord? Jesus. Thus declares the Lord, who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the people around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it'll be against Judah. It'll come about in that day that I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone where all the peoples and all who lift it will be crit critically injured. This is the burden of Jesus concerning not just Israel, but Jerusalem. The main issue, the main issue is not the Golan Heights. 
It's not Gaza, and it's not even the West Bank. It's the final status of Jerusalem. That is where Satan got his biggest defeat, and it's where he is going to get his final defeat, according to Zechariah, and he knows it. Jesus said in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. This is bound up with the prophecies of the prophet Daniel. Jesus directly said in Luke 21 that Jews would have to be back there. Not just in that nation, but in that city. In Matthew 23, 39, Jesus said, Weeping over Jerusalem, 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 you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Jews must be back in Jerusalem for him to return. As Zechariah said, as Jesus said, Satan knows this. So he must try to get the Jews out of there to prevent the return of Christ by any means he can. He'll use Islam, he'll use the United Nothing. In my native New York, I used to live right across the street from the United Nothing. Let me tell you about the United Nothing. I looked out my window, saw it every day. You could tell by the diplomatic license plates and the flags on the cars who the ambassadors to the United Nations were because they could park in certain places around the neighborhood where other people couldn't. And I saw customized Cadillacs and Lincoln Continentals, Mercedes limousines, Rolls Royce, Bentleys. People from the poorest countries on the face of the earth. <laughs> Living like kings in New York and then going into the United Nothing and denouncing Western imperialism in America. And all. <laughs> you think these people care about their own people? <laughs> they don't care about their own people. They just use that as a political platform to line their own pockets. It's all based on corruption and hypocrisy. The world lies in the power of the wicked one. I lived right across the street from it. I saw what it's like. Well, let's look at Zechariah. I am going to make Jerusalem a heavy stone. Who is responsible for the mess in the Middle East? Is it the Jews? No. Is it the Arabs? No. The Muslims? No. Is it the devil? No. They all have a hand in it. But it is God himself. I am going to make Jerusalem a heavy stone. God is dealing with Israel and the Jews about their rejection of their own Messiah, Yeshua. They're under the curse of the law, the Torah. Moses warned them, when the Messiah comes in Deuteronomy 18, if you don't listen to him, I will require it of you. These things happened because they turned away from God. Oh, they may have religion, you understand. Orthodox Jews have plenty of religion. They're very religious. The Orthodox are. The secular ones are irreligious. Plenty of religion. But it's false. You see, the problem with unsaved Jews is not that they 
don't believe in Jesus. That's not the problem. That's the result of the problem. In John chapter 5, Jesus told them, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. Their problem is they don't believe in Moses and the prophets. They don't believe the Old Testament. Because if they did, they would believe the New. If they really believed Moses and the prophets, they'd know Jesus is the Messiah. Now they've got religion! <laughs> but they don't have Jesus. South Africa has always had religion. Well, if you've had some good people like Andrew Murray and things like that, I don't deny this, but uh, here in the Orange Free State, it's what we call in America a Bible Belt. Everybody goes to church for cultural reasons. They think they're okay with God because they keep the laws. Because they go to the Domini. Because they were sprinkled as a baby. Orthodox Jews think because they were circumcised as a baby. That makes them all right. They believe the rabbi instead of the Domini. But it's the same thing. But they've got religion. They've got lots of religion. They don't have Jesus. South Africa? I used to think that the worst heretics in the world and the biggest religious con artists in the world came from the United States. Kenny, Benny, and Joyce. But when I began coming over here a number of years ago, and I saw Cousin Theo and Uncle Ray McCauley, <laughs> oh, they got religion, but they don't have Jesus. Their God is mammon. Uh, Jerusalem has got plenty of religion. No shortage of it. What kind of religion you want? Orthodox Judaism, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Islam. They got plenty of religion. South Africa has got plenty of religion. Heck, you've got Desmond Tutu who wants to ordain lesbian priestesses into the Anglican Communion. You got Ray McCauley, who issued the Rustenburg Declaration. He said, building the Tower of Babel is God's model for Christian unity. <coughs> He's either a heretic or a nut. Plenty of religion. Make no mistake about it. Although I'm talking about my family, the land of my children's birth, Israel has all this trouble. All this anxiety about war. All of this hatred and bias against it from the rest of the world. But God has allowed it because of their sin. Because of their rejection of him. Even though they are absolutely experts at camouflaging it with religion. The 
bias and the bigotry that went on here for generations, they camouflaged it with religion. The Dutch Reformed Church did it. And now you've got Desmond Tutu doing it for the black people. It doesn't matter black or white. It doesn't matter Cape colored or Asian. That don't matter. You're either in Christ or you're not. Understand, these things happen to nations who knew the truth. The Jews had the truth. The British had the truth. America had the truth. New Zealand had the truth. And South Africa had the truth. It had the truth. But where much is given, much is expected. Well, let's look at Zechariah once more. A time is coming in their desperation where the Lord will intervene for them. In verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So they'll look upon me who they pierced, crucified, and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping for a firstborn. In their desperation, they called out to God. Only in their desperation did they turn to the Messiah they rejected? Only in their desperation, it's going to happen. Now again, this is a generalization. There will always be individual Jews who believe. There will always be individuals of any nation or people that believe. But corporately as a nation, no. Nope, they have to be desperate. And they have to realize that these things are happening because of their sin. And they have to realize where much is given, much is expected. It wasn't the prophecy, what I said 20 years ago. It was just sanctified common sense. When I said, the ANC is going to do what Mugabe's doing, give him enough time. These farms are leveraged and have mortgages, many of them. It'll cause a banking crisis in the country that will affect the national economy. Additionally, if you don't know, because of the deficits of Obama and the deficits in Europe, the quantitative easing, the Americans and Europeans printed money. That artificially raised the price of gold, you understand? And as a result of the price of gold being driven up artificially because of quantitative easing, that made the rand more buoyant. It made the rand artificially stronger than it would be. I told people several years ago, you're going to see 20 rand to the British pound. It almost is that now. Now that the quantitative easing is over, price of gold goes down, the rand is going down with it. This country is heading for an economic crisis. 
And the Chinese are already negotiating to buy this place for $2.50. Providing they can't get you down, two bucks even. That's what's happening, you understand. That's what's happening. But it's not just you. In Chicago this past weekend, 10 blacks were shot dead by other blacks. 53 were shot, most of them seriously. Just in Chicago! Philadelphia, Baltimore, the other cities of America, particularly those controlled by the Democratic Party, it's a similar story. People getting shot like that, kids on their way to school getting shot, people afraid to take the kids to school. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar, that kind of gun violence? Well, the murder rate in London, England, has surpassed the murder rate in New York this year for the first time, and they don't even have any guns. You see, America had the gospel, too. You read the founding documents of the United States, the preamble to the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, and we're endowed by their creator. American democracy was predicated on the belief in the Judeo-Christian God. Outside the Parliament in London, it says, on the Parliament, right on the Big Ben, Paternoster Quius and Chalius, our Father who art in heaven. America's under God's judgment. Britain is under God's judgment. Israel is under God's judgment. And you are under God's judgment. Why? Because of all the nations, we had the truth. There's no other country on the African continent that had as much gospel as South Africa. Not one! There's no other nation in the world that were the chosen people of God through whom he gave his word and sent the Messiah other than the Jews. Not one! Britain, America, all the same. This is what is happening. And that is why it is happening. You have no friends. You have no friends. You understand? You're like Israel. You have no friends. other than true believers. Even many secular Jews know that there's something different about premillennial born-again Christians. Why do these people like us when everybody else hates us? Netanyahu knows that. But in terms of politics and nations and media and academics, you have no friends. You have no friends. A Christian heritage means nothing, but you no longer have a Christian heritage. You don't live up to it, it's worthless, abject, bankrupt. You have no friends, you have no heritage. Forget about the war trekkers, that's history. It doesn't mean anything to anybody, anywhere, anymore. I'm sorry to tell you the truth when they put the Jews into ovens. Their long history of Elijah and Moses and Jeremiah meant nothing. 
แม้หรอกเกินครับ No you have no friends and you have no heritage Do I want to sit here and tell you you have no future? I don't believe the world has a future. I believe the Earth has a future because of the return of Jesus, but I don't believe the world has a future. But you can have a future. Your family can have a future. This church can have a future. Are you desperate? Are you desperate? In Egypt, it's when the Jews got desperate. They rejected Moses the first time. They had to become desperate. Well, friends, this situation in South Africa is becoming desperate. I have seen this before in other countries. I've seen it before in other places. I know what it's like to have to live like this. I don't believe there's a political solution. I don't believe. There is an economic solution. I don't even believe that there is a spiritual solution if the church remains in the state it presently is. Before the Babylonian captivity, instead of listening to Jeremiah. Instead of listening to Amos, instead of listening to Micah, they listened to false prophets. In this country, instead of listening to Amos, instead of listening to Jeremiah, instead of listening to Micah, they're listening to Uncle Angus. You understand what I'm saying? Now I don't like talking this way, and I don't like saying these things. But somebody's got to tell you the truth. No, there is a solution. It's not coming from politicians. It's not coming from theocrats. It's not coming from economists. It's coming from Jesus. He is coming, and he knows what you're going through. I can't give you a prophecy or an easy word. There are people here who can't get visas to get out. Maybe the Australians are going to open their borders to take white refugees if things, or when things get really desperate, and if Mr. Trump stays in power, the Americans will do the same thing. But you don't want to leave, do you? Well, you don't want to. But what did Jesus say? When they persecute you in one place, flee to flee to the other. We have no home in this world. Now I can't tell you a time is coming when the Lord's going to tell you to leave. You may have to. What I can tell you is this: I can't give you a program. <coughs> I can't give you an easy solution. But I can tell you one thing for sure: 
What are we going to do? What about our children, our grandchildren? What's going to happen to the farms? What's going to happen? Is there going to be a civil war? What's... I can't tell you. But there's one thing I can tell you for sure. Put your eyes on Jesus, not the problem. Commit your way to the Lord, it says in Proverbs. Commit your way to the Lord. And your plans will be established. You seek him. You get on your knees with your family. You get on your knees as a church and you seek him. He will tell you exactly what to do. When the Babylonian captivity was impending, Israel was backslidden. And Jeremiah and his friends were in a situation where they had Egypt on one side and Babylon on the other. Where should we go, Egypt or Babylon? What a choice. But the answer was not in Egypt, more in Babylon. The answer was to be in the palm of God. When Jesus spoke of the last days, he said, be anxious for nothing. He said, when you see these things happening, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. He said, ethnon will rise against ethnon. It'll be racial. He said, or tribal. He said, no, if I could come in here, and give you a program or give you a plan, my opinion would be worth as much as the next person's. But I can give you a promise. Commit your way to the Lord and your plans will be established. God bless and thank you for listening. The Lord bless you.